We zijn weer terug in Den Haag. The Border Sessions, uh, an international festival on technology and society. Um, my next guest is, is already next to me, uh, Daisy Ginsberg, uh, a designer, a writer, an artist. When you are at a party and you have to explain to someone you don't know what you do, what it is you do, what do you tell? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. I, I, um, sometimes I wish I, I originally started training to be an architect and that would have been an easier way to describe it. But mostly I'm a designer or an artist interested in design. And I spent quite a bit of time working in emerging technologies, especially synthetic biology. <laughs> so it's so complicated, the yeah. story. So then they say, well, okay, but really, nice to have met you. <laughs> I use design as a way to explore the values of society. And, and I'm asking how we use design to shape those values. So do you do this on an a, 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 a intellectual level? or? Well, I'm as a practice. A practitioner of design I'm trying to work out how we how we might make design in that way so I come from a, a background of something called critical design which came out of the Royal College of Art in London I've gone back to do a PhD there and I'm yeah trying to work out how through design practice that maybe sits outside of commerce how we use it as a research tool but also as an active way to shape values and shape the way we want the world to be. Yeah, but so you don't build things I yourself. make things, I've yeah. made. Um, <laughs> often they are uh, sort of projects that are uh, fictions, so stories, but told through designed objects. So they often sit in galleries. I've curated exhibitions, um, worked with scientists and artists and designers on a, a project, a big project called Synthetic Aesthetics, which will be talking about the book that came out of that project here this afternoon at Border Sessions and finding different ways um, from sort of intervening in science to sort of causing mayhem and uh, you know, asking the difficult questions, finding ways that designers and artists and scientists and social scientists can work together to kind of ask these difficult questions. Really, it's about asking difficult questions. And, and, and what are the difficult questions? Well, for me, working in synthetic biology, it's been, if scientists want to design living things and design life, what kinds of things should we design um, and where do we draw you know, the limits of design and what would good design mean and you know, can, we, can designers help answer these questions or who do we need to help us even understand what this means, you know, what kinds of experts and design becomes an interesting mediator to bring lots of different disciplines together. So there isn't a set, you know, I, my own practice I've made um, sort of fictions and stories, I make objects and artworks, um, but then there's also this other kind of practice which is about bringing discussions together and curating others, um, everything from, in the Synthetic Aesthetics book we have cheese made from human body bacteria <laughs> to um, uh, kind of philosophical discussions about you know, evolution machines and um, I think it all can come under the remit of design. But why is it important to think about things like this, um, to, to talk about it? Well, otherwise, who will think about it? Do we want to leave it just to you know, the economics of a system? Or what kinds of values do we want to shape our world by? And I think there's um, different ways to ask these questions. So it's not that designers and artists should be asking these questions, but um, you know, do we, how do we imagine the implications of technologies. There's lots of different ways to do that. One way is through more traditional sort of bioethics and social sciences. Um, one way is just to let it happen and let the market rule. Um, and one way maybe is to kind of employ the imaginations of designers and artists and others, storytellers, to actually imagine futures. And I think all of these things together it becomes powerful to say, well, what you know, how do we actually govern something that doesn't yet exist? How do we develop frameworks for, for technologies that mm -hmm. are rapidly um, advancing and developing and might change the way we live? You know, how do we actually wrestle control back from the economic forces? If those, well, maybe those are the forces that we should live by. I personally don't think they are. No. Um, so, uh, and to be able to make space to ask those questions is a, de is a democratic process. Yeah. So, so what what would be wrong, you think, uh, when we would live by these economic yeah. forces? What, what, I think what, what, I think that's what we see now in um, sort of the anxiety around genetically modified organisms, for example. You know, there's fears around the technology itself. You know, do we? You know, what does it mean to engineer living things? Do we fully understand the implications of engineering something and putting it into the environment? Those are good and valid questions. There's moral and ethical questions around you know, should we be uh, playing God? Um, but then there's also economic and social questions. Well, who gets to control the technology? You know, as 
Um, the way it's set up now, the way uh, sort of the intellectual property and ownership of technologies works, you know, there's a very small group of people who control a large um, base of people using a technology. And that's one of the oppositions to genetically modified organisms is the farmer can't save his seeds mm -hmm. because it, or her seeds because it works um, under an economic model. So for me, it's like cracking open all of these discussions. You know, a technology isn't um, independent of people. We could say, well, a technology is neutral. Well, it's yeah. a technology. The technology is suddenly there. It's a tool, yeah. and we get yeah. to shape that tool with our politics and, ide and ideologies. And the same for design. We say, well, design is just a tool to do things. Well, it's controlled by people and people's values. Um, and those politics and ideologies that shape those values shape design. Yeah. So with all these things, it's about saying, how do we reclaim responsibility and power yeah. to actually shape these things? Yeah. And do you feel that enough people are, are um, well, concerned yeah. about yeah. this or are being yeah. involved in this? I think so. I mean, at events like this, you start to see sort of artists and practitioners and writers and um, innovators who are finding different ways to challenge the status quo but they're not necessarily mainstream um, you know no. they're not a, you no. know, we're aware they're, they're bringing awareness perhaps but it's not um, you know those values aren't necessarily winning out and I think that um, it's important that these kinds of discussions are happening but the next stage is well what do we do about it yeah is there hope for yeah. those discussions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you can already see yeah. that there's, a, uh, well, there are people yeah. who are in, at, at the yeah. frontier. They, yeah. they, they know what's going on, yeah. they are the early mm. adopters, they see what's happening, mm. but there are a lot of people who well, just seem lost. They, they, yeah. they don't even understand mm. the simple technology yeah. which is going on. Mm. And, and, and I, sometimes I feel the gap is widening yeah. between the two. Is, is that something you can see as well? Uh, well, I think that you know, I already feel outdated when it comes to lots of technologies and I see um, you know, I'm sort of the early, of, maybe I'm like the first year of the millennial kind of grouping and I'm like, oh, I don't think I, you know, I don't use technology in the way millennials use technology. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's this, a rate of change that is kind of terrifying, but it's still, it's not about technology, it's about the values that shape those technologies. So yeah. you know, we get to choose in theory, but if we're embedding ourselves into a world where we don't actually have any freedom, then the, then that's what's at risk. Yeah, um, yeah. But, it, but it, can you choose when you don't know what, what thing, what, what's possible? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't, do you think you can? <laughs> No, I, yeah. I think I would like yeah. to know yeah. what, what, what's yeah. possible if, 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 if they, yeah. well, I can, I can imagine that they're changing mm. uh, well, mm. DNA in plants yeah. or things like yeah. that it could be a good yeah. thing, but, but because yeah. uh, all of a sudden plants can grow in the desert, yeah. for instance, yeah. but it could also be really bad. Yeah, I mean, the ramifications of that, um, you know, it could mean that we disrupt an ecosystem. I mean, yeah. my... Yeah. Yeah. And you can't oversee this. Yeah, it's but it's the same with digital technologies. I mean, I don't see necessarily a difference between them. You know, we sort of we eagerly embrace you know new technologies, and we kind of throw away our privacy and we throw away our data, and we don't even consider the ramifications. But um, if we knew more, or if we um, had the ability to choose, you know, how would we behave? And I think we'd probably behave differently. Yeah. And I think those are really important questions that we constantly have to remind ourselves of because everything in the way the system is set up is set up to make us follow you know, the path of least resistance, which is something that's sort of run by corporations and yeah. economic systems. Yeah. So um, it might not be in our best interest. But at the same time, these things are... Um, you know, if you think a hundred years ago, you know, the kinds of corporations that are dominating the world now, and the kinds of corporations that dominated the world a century ago, you know, a century from now. Um, I was joking yesterday that uh, Amazon, you know, maybe because you know they're talking about with their drone deliveries, that maybe will, you know, in ten years' time, Amazon will be opening shops as the new innovation. And then I read yesterday they just opened their first bookshop. <laughs> <I'm saying. laughs> the future, yeah. the future, it's a bookshop. Um, it's like how ironic, you know, the problem that Amazon has made is um, the kind of increased amount of deliveries going around cities causing congestion which slows down their delivery time so then, you know, we'll bring in drones to deliver things and then, you know, why not have centralized collection points which are shops? So, um, you know, the work, we, we assume that structures are embedded and we can't do anything about it but actually, um, over a passage of time, things change rapidly but yeah. my concern is 
where we make changes that it makes it um, we assume that there's no choice but to make that change when actually there is a choice yeah yeah so are you positive or yeah. negative when you look at the future well, that's what I've been trying to work out I mean I actually think the future is in the present um, I don't I think part of the problem is that we see it as ahead of us so it's inevitable and it's not I mean the things that we um, our present is made of the future so this table you know we chose to somebody chose to make this table now rather than you know, the tree could have been left standing and someone else could have used it in, in 10 years time um, so the materials that we build our world from are borrowed from the future and I find that a really interesting way to kind of collapse the present and the future together um, I still don't know what to do with that idea yet that's no. something I'm trying to work out at the moment but it makes me feel less worried about the my lack of hope for the future you know, I think what we need to do is change things in the present rather than be hopeful for a future to arrive like that's the way to claim responsibility so that's what I'm trying to write about at the moment is mm -hmm. to to understand you know that shift of perspective and how that might change my practice as a designer yeah so change things now what yeah and if you have to be practical what yeah. what should we change now um well, I think a lot of it is about um actually you know, is about discussion and about an opening up and understanding the ramifications of what we're doing and actively um, sort of changing systems and, and choosing the ways that we consume or the ways that we don't consume and actually demanding questions. You know, a lot of the things I've discovered working in um, in sort of emerging scientific technologies is there's a fear of debate because it might shut down a field of science. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, I think that's really worrying. I think that we have to, and it's not worrying that you know, science doesn't want to de debate the consequences, but what's worrying is that their risk of losing their funding if mm -hmm. there is a debate. So you know, what they're doing is not, they're not trying to be evil, but the way we've set up um, scientific funding means that if the public responds badly, it'll just get shut down. Yeah. So how do we actually have a more um, informed discussion? How do we actually, you know, we can't just imagine the possible benefits and risks. How do we actually shape something now and say, well, these are the values we want a science to be built on? You know? yeah. But um, how do we do this? Because right, that's what. Because it's yeah. so big. It's, yeah. uh, of course, sometimes yeah. you see uh, programs at television yeah. where you can find things on the internet or read good yeah. articles or books or anything. Yeah. But for most people, yeah. it's 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 too difficult, yeah. maybe, and it's yeah. too big, and yeah. it's too. But well, I think there's also the assumption that you know every citizen has to be concerned with every problem. I don't think that's you know, mm -hmm. that's what we have experts for. But saying um, you know, the things that we do choose as citizens are you know how we consume, how our, our the governance that affects us. I mean even. You know, I was really intrigued recently in the UK they brought in an, in England they brought in a new law that shops have to charge five pence for a plastic bag yeah, in Holland yeah. system, and it already yeah. existed in Wales this law and I think maybe in Scotland and in Wales it was every shop had to charge it in England they made the rules so only shops with um, over 200 employees <laughs> so small shops don't are exempt from this rule no. so suddenly well, as a consumer you can say well I'm going to choose to take a bag everywhere I go also because otherwise it's just too complicated to imagine you, know, you go to a shop am I going to pay for a bag are there 200 people working in this shop <laughs> or you know employees in this I mean to give that to the consumer those are moments where you actually want clear governance and you want to yeah. but you can also as a consumer you know demand um, you know you stop using plastic bags yeah. and, and bring your own yeah and there's um, you know we kind of forget that we have that power and agency um, so I'm kind of against the design of systems that are so smooth that they stop us believe, remembering that we have power and agency. Because yeah. um, I think it works both ways. I mean, these are all ideas that I'm trying to figure out at the moment to see how they position you know, what I believe that we can do with design. Yeah. And that's the other thing. It's less you know, giving the, you know, it's, we get to choose and it's bringing back that sense of choice, yeah. I think. So it's work in progress. We yeah. won't find all the answers. <laughs> no, you definitely won't find the thing. Probably Please. never. No, my, I mean, my, the work I've done is really about um, making a space for asking questions. Saying, well, how, there aren't any answers no. because there are, um, there are many right answers to these things. And we kind of assume that there is one right answer. No. And there isn't. It no. depends on the situation. It depends who's making the decision. Yeah. Um, 
and so I'm really interested in this idea of the common good as well and who who gets to decide what that common good is and I think with you know you can look at a technology like synthetic biology or genetic engineering and well it depends it depends if it's the corporation if it's the scientist if it's you know a farmer if it's a small farmer or a big farmer um, the, there is no right answer to whether it's a good technology it's, yeah. it's how we use it and how we make it as good for as many or or should it be made good for a few? And will that few be able to spread the good to others? I don't know. These are, it's a, yeah. I <laughs> so I'm hopeful in that um, that there are ways to address these things or new ways to address them. But um, I think by as humans we are hopeful. Yeah, that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be. Yeah. 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 Oké, okay, well, okay. thank you very much. Mijn pleasure, thank you. Nee. Tot zover, sterk zijn we weer terug met een volgende gast. Blijf kijken.